Thank you. And, and the first thing I'd say is uh, to congratulate uh, Dr. Rosenberg and the group here for uh, organizing a, a symposium like this. It's a little bit of, for a surgeon and for some of you, is a little bit thinking out of the box. And uh, before I t uh, took over as chair, I was talking to Abe uh, Fuchs about how, how I lack the ability to measure impact of technical change. And, and the need to uh, work together with people who have that ex expertise and come to reasonable solutions. So I think we're off to a good start, and I think without further ado, we'll hear from uh, Christopher Krenner. Thanks very much. Um, pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm going to talk about um, sham controls in surgical trials, or sometimes I'll use the term placebo surgery interchangeably, and people have go back and forth between calling it sham surgery or placebo surgery, a little bit intending on what they want to convey about the nature of this experimental technique. I have two um, main purposes for, for talking about this. The first is that we have a sense of the randomized control trial as a single sort of tool that's progressively reforming the evidentiary base of medicine and surgery. Um, but it's really an assemblage of different elements uh, con uh, the pro prospect of trials, control arms, randomization comparisons. So, and, and as we've seen from yesterday's talk, I think um, Ulrich Troller showed us in particular, that some of these different elements have appeared and disappeared over time. It's not that they've been just steadily assembled in a progressive way. And though I'm not immune to the notion of a progressive movement of reform from these kinds of uh, higher standards for evidence within medicine. I also want to look at some of the contingency of the elements of it. And the placebo trials are actually a very nice way to look at that, especially in surgery, because they've had such a contentious and complicated sort of path in medicine that I hope I'll be able to illustrate. And my second point is that uh, the, the interesting um, problem with placebo or sham controls in surgery was some of the, the ethical quandaries that they put experimentalists in. Um, and I think, uh, ironically, some of the increasing regulatory and bioethical scrutiny of medical practice made it smooth the way for the use of these tools that were previously seen as um, more difficult to apply. Um, and let me show you sort of, uh, I'm going to go through a few of the sort of highlights of this story to, to show this point. This is a, um, uh, an illustration from one of the first um, modern sham surgical controlled randomized trials. Um, there were actually two of them that happened nearly simultaneously in 1958. Um, unbeknownst to the two investigators, Leonard Cobb was uh, a principal in a group in Seattle and uh, E. Gray Diamond was a principal investigator in a group in Kansas City in 1958. Uh, they were both studying this procedure called internal mammary artery ligation. Uh, at the time in the 50s, increasingly popular and seemingly very promising way to treat ischemia, cardiac ischemia. And the notion was that by um, making a, a superficial incision in the chest wall and then ligating the two what were then called internal mammary arteries, now called the thoracic arteries, uh, they would push blood back into the failing coronary circulation and improve uh, blood supply to the heart. Um, Cobb and uh, Diamond, for, for various reasons, a number of other people at the time, were suspicious of the putative uh, physiological basis for the procedure to help angina. And both of them hit upon the idea of doing a sham controlled trial of it. They didn't actually know at the time that they were both working on the same problem with the, in the, with the same tools. But they met at the American Heart Association in San Francisco in 1958 and were um, surprised to learn of each other's existence and perhaps pleased to um, discover they had come to the same conclusions, which helped uh, secure the unity of science, as it were. Um, they both found that the internal mammary artery ligation, when it was compared um, to patients who had a fake version of the very same procedure that involved just making an incision in the chest wall, kind of looking at the internal mammary arteries, and then closing up the incision, patients who had that had very much the same outcomes as patients who had the actual ligation of the internal mammary arteries. And this was the first sort of randomized, sham-controlled trial. It had um, a couple of effects, the results of these two trials. They made a big splash at the time, and uh, some reports about it actually made the New York Times subsequently. Uh, the, one of the um, consequences was that 
the internal memory RDA ligation procedure quickly lost credibility. It was debunked, in essence, and, and faded from use. Um, the other result was people became very convinced and intrigued by the power of these sham controls to affect patients. And this is an illustration of a um, EKG tracing from one of the patients in the Seattle study. Um, it shows the inversion of the T waves, that's a bad sign, um, with, with exercise and a tremor. One of the people involved in the Seattle tr trial was Robert Bruce, who is the person who created the exercise tolerance test in um, cardiology. You walk on a treadmill and then monitor the EKG and you see changes showing ischemia. Um, they were able to show that in patients before the procedure, um, and much, much to the surprise of the people in Seattle, these T waves flipped back the right way in the patient who had one of the sham controls. So we're very impressed with the um, results. People often felt better with the sham surgery, and in fact, about the same rate at which they felt better from the internal memory ligation. This, of course, caught the attention of a number of people, perhaps most prominent among them, Henry K. Beecher, who used these two sham control trials published in 1959, 1960, to promote the idea that surgery itself had this very powerful placebo effect that the manipulations of people in surgery, the risk, the, um, that all the, the um, intensity of that in intervention created a sense of being cared for. There's other things, other sort of nonspecific factors, but Henry Beecher's notion was that this was a powerful placebo surgery. Um, but his, uh, his presence as the sort of main um, test testifier to all this creates a little bit of a ambiguity in our story. Um, Beecher was also known at that time uh, as a very vigorous advocate for the ethical conduct of human subjects research. Um, and those of you who know his name may associate him with some of his um, uh, lobbying for a greater attention to, uh, uh, to the rights of patients and to ethical conduct of trials. Um, but um, in this case, he faced a fairly complicated question about the placebo controls in the surgical trial. Um, there are some obvious challenges in doing sham controlled surgery trials, uh, right? Uh, you have to convince people to do it in the first place. How, how do people get into sham controlled trials? They may be randomized to receive a fake surgery. It seems like quite a large intervention to subject people to if there's no therapeutic intent, it's just a, a fake. Um, and so, uh, you know, you might wonder about what, the, what ways in which people could be drawn into these trials and how do they, how, what are they told about these trials? Well, it turns out um, in the early studies in Seattle and Kansas City, the people who were recruited to the trials knew very little about them. Um, the Seattle group was a little bit more explicit about what they were um, told, the people who get, entered the trial. They were told only that they were entering a, an experimental trial of the internal memory artery ligation, but according to their publication, they were not informed of the double-blinded nature of the study. They didn't know that there was this other arm. Um, so in Kansas City, uh, I spoke actually with E. Gray Diamond. Um, he passed away just about two years ago, but I had a chance to interview him about these trials before he did. Um, and he was a, a bit um, hesitant to talk about the informed consent part. It's pretty clear that the people knew very little about what they were being brought into. And he, w he was very, he said always, and when people were talking about this, this could never have been done subsequent to when we did it. Um, um, but, but Beecher um, had, uh, as he began to call out some experimentalists for their um, conduct, he never um, made a complaint against the interim MRR ligation trials. It doesn't come up in his lists of unethical um, trials. In 1966, he publishes a very important article in the New England Journal exposing a number of um, well-publicized uh, medical tr experiments for their unethical conduct. But he doesn't say that about the internal memory art delegation trials. Um, and in fact, he um, says that in, in his publication about the trials, he said, of course, these trials could only be done with the complete concurrence of the patients. And he saw, sees the published Seattle trial saying that people weren't told about the blind in nature. So what's going on with this? What, what, um, how is Beecher in his... Um, in his own mind, sort of resolving these questions. Well, you have to look a little bit at the nature of what people thought of as being consent in the 1950s and 1960s when Beecher's writing. Um, 
Uh, there's a wonderful book out now that has really examined this question in detail by Laura Stark. It's called Behind Closed Doors, IRBs, IB, IRBs and the Making of Ethical Research. And she looks at the NIH Clinical Center as the origins of some of the practices for consent. And if you look at the procedures at the NIH Clinical Center, the intramural program within the campus in Bethesda, um, the consent had a, um, was understood to be obligatory for any sorts of medical interventions, for getting people into trials, but the, what the, the nature and the content of what consent meant was very heterogeneous. And uh, Laura Stark talks about how people were um, noted to be assumed to be consenting by coming into the hospital because they knew it was a ho an experimental hospital, for example. Other experimentalists did more thorough things with documented notes uh, that pe people would sign in a form that would be more familiar in the modern um, version of consent. But there was certainly a lot of leeway to, for experimentalists to know what consent entailed and what you know, informed consent wasn't wasn't a phrase quite like that, but the idea that people would know what they were doing when they got consent. And Beecher gives us a very clear insight to that. In his publication simultaneously in 1966 with the very famous publication in the Unger Journal condemning a number of unethical medical research trials, he also writes in the JAMA about, quote, consent in clinical experimentation. And in that um, um, publication, he explicitly notes that when you're comparing a placebo intervention with an active intervention, when you're looking at outcomes of pain, um, disclosing the full nature of the experiment that may distort the results. So Beecher believed that um, knowing that you might get a placebo would affect people's reporting about their subjective experience of the trial and would therefore distort the trial. Um, he, and he is making exemptions, in, in, in essence, for these um, internal memory artery ligation trials, which are placebo-controlled surgical trials. He, he wasn't alone in that notion. It was fairly widespread among experimentalist physicians who were researchers in the 1960s. Um, it was, uh, um, the, the view was expressed that you could um, do trials without disclosing placebo use. And um, many very conscientious uh, researchers thinking about this said as long as you believe that uh, the therapeutic value of the experimental arm, the, the thing you're testing, and the control arm were similar, then you weren't doing anything unethical. You're randomizing people to two things that had similar effect. If you thought there was a placebo effect, you were okay. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this was part of a sort of more general sense that uh, was um, a, a general kind of confusion among physicians at the time about this problem of consent and information. Um, in, 19, in the late 60s, a large survey found that um, among research physicians, fully half found it not to be uh, um, acceptable not to reveal to a patient that, quote, she had been enrolled in a double-blind clinical trial of an experimental cancer drug and was currently receiving a placebo. So this notion about disclosing about placebos was thought to be fairly complicated and that the um, risk of, of um, invalidating the results was pretty high and the um, and the notion of consent was thought to be um, uh, more mud muddled and heterogeneous than we now think of it as being. So Beecher sort of in a mainstream in that regard. And in that setting, there's a bit of um, anxiety about, because there's also people who speak out very strongly against this at the same time on the other side. So in that um, setting, there's a bit of anxiety about the use of these kind of trials. Um, but there, but are also in the 60s other kinds of incentives that arise for doing placebo-controlled trials of surgeries and invasive procedures. Um, and surgery, for example, was pressing at that time to um, to to achieve um, a, 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 a surgical ends in a greater range of of of, of problems. Um, to use less risky and less invasive kinds of surgery and techniques to uh, a treat a greater variety of kind of chronic or less acute conditions. And this had long been um, a goal among surgeons. We already heard from um, yesterday, Stephanie Snow was telling us about how operations in the 1840s for squinting and club foot were appearing. So this is not something that was new to the late 20th century, but the tools and the techniques of surgery had become so good by the late 20th century, the ability to reduce pain, the ability to reduce risk, that the potential to open up to a wider range of kinds of procedures is, um, is becoming much more 
evident. Also, there's huge funds pouring into surgical research in the 1950s through the NIH. And the, um, in the course of the 50s, the amount of money from the federal budget into NIH research um, uh, doubles. Um, and, and it's even uh, goes, I looked compared to the, the gross domestic product also just soars during this period, but the rise in the investment of the federal government in medical research outstrips the rise in the gross domestic product over the same period. Lots of money going in, lots of interest in expanding the range. And one of the people who's a spokesperson for this movement is Owen Wangenstein, um, just a, 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 um, a leader within academic surgery of the night of the middle of the 20th century, who apparently trained um, a whole generation of chairs and leaders across the North America in surgery. Um, and he was based at Minnesota for most of his life. Some of his interventions were, the, the thing he's most famous for is the um, nasogastric suction to, um, to mitigate the problem of small bowel obstruction, which is actually a way of avoiding surgery. Um, and he was in the 1950s working on um, surgeries for ulcer disease, which is a major problem in, in, uh, in sort of high income countries in the, 19, in the middle of the 20th century, um, complicated by problems with hemorrhage and perforation. Um, uh, and he was devising, um, he was working on things like a gastrectomy and a vagotomy, these invasive procedures on the stomach to try to mitigate the problems of ulcers. But he also was interested in other ways of treating ulcers that wouldn't be so invasive. And he hit upon this. He was working with um, ice water lavage for um, hemorrhage from the stomach, and he hit upon the idea that you could reduce the digestive activities in the stomach by cooling the inside of the stomach. Um, and using this ice water lavage gave him the notion. He went back to the animal lab um, at University of Minnesota, began to work with cooling animal stomachs and checking digestive activity. And he um, devised these very dramatic um, demonstrations of the effectiveness of his technique. He took, uh, in one instance, he published an experiment where he attached a little oxygen line to the nose of a tiny frog and then inserted the frog into the stomach of a larger frog and timed how long it could last um, without being digested. Um, and uh, found that when he cooled the stomach of the larger frog, the small frog could be pulled out intact after many hours with this little oxygen line still attached. So you could survive. When you cool the stomach, you would reduce these digestive activities. And his, his thought was, well, we could perhaps cool the stomach enough to slow digestive activity and heal ulcers in the stomach. Um, and he built this machine, working with the Swenko Refrigeration Company in Minnesota, um, that would refrigerate the inside of the stomach. Um, it was called gastric freezing, um, and the, and um, he began to publish. Um, he worked on this in the lab, and then he did case case tri case series. He just tried it on a series of patients and sort of saw good results with the reduction in pain from from ulcers, um, and also could measure different kinds of uh, stomach acid secretions that were seen to be affected by the gastric freezing procedure. It quickly became very popular. It spread across the nation, and there were thousands of these procedures being performed, um, much sort of to Wangenstein's dismay, who thought of it still as an experimental procedure he was working on perfecting, but it was already in widespread use. And in that setting, people became um, al alarmed about the rapid spread and rapid use of this, particularly among surgeons, actually. The surgeons in Minnesota who weren't at uh, University of Minnesota became um, concerned that this was a very um, simple, uh, flip of the switch kind of treatment for something that they were treating with uh, really quite radical surgery um, for ulcers. And they thought perhaps uh, something this simple maybe didn't really work. Um, it was also quite a lot of knowledge about uh, within surgery because of the intermammary ligation trials of these sham controlled studies. And so sham controlled studies of gastric freezing began to be mounted. And there were um, over a dozen of them during the 1960s. Several of them randomized placebo controlled trials. And the evidence began to mount that um, in many of these trials, the most famous of them published in 1969 in New England Journal of Medicine again, um, showing that if you did gastric freezing on a set of randomized patients and compared it with the results from a fake version of it, that the results were very, very similar. And so this gastric freezing may have made people feel better. They walked away from Wangenstein's lab often saying that they had been relieved of their ulcer problems. Um, but it might simply have been a non-specific effect of therapy or what was called a placebo effect in those days. Um.
But also, so this, so this again, this power of this placebo control trial to change medical treatment. Quickly, they stopped selling Swenko refrigeration devices. The procedure rapidly declined in use. I mean, at the same time, also, the people thought that this was a powerful enough ev piece of evidence, this randomized control, um, placebo controlled trial, that you could actually, that it actually should stop Wangenstein from doing some of the work he was doing experimentally. He felt he could still continue to try to improve this technique, even though he'd seen some of these results that were negative, and make it better so that it would work. Um, but he received a very um, alarming letter in 1967 from a prominent gastroenterologist, Morton I. Grossman, saying that it was unethical for um, Dr. Wangstein to continue with his um, experiments in the lab and then using the um, refreezing procedure on patients in a kind of controlled setting um, experimentally because there weren't good randomized control evidence and these sham controlled studies had been showing no effect. And so Wangenstein wrote back, there's this great correspondence in the Wangenstein archives between Grossman and Wangenstein, back and forth debating um, whether he can continue with sort of these um, case series studies in the face of randomized control evidence. Wangenstein tries to wrap up the debate. He doesn't convince Grossman, but he says, look, your philosophy and mine could exist side by side. Um, you're, you are keen for controlled experiment, but I'm equally enthusiastic for the sequence of observation experiment and experience, which he thought amply demonstrated at least a promise um, within the gastric freezing study. And that was Wang and C's style. He never really embraced uh, in the 50s, certainly earlier not, um, the notion of randomized control trials as being appropriate within surgery. I think we'll hear um, David Jones will talk more extensively about the larger question of randomized control trials within surgery. Um, but so, so there's these, um, to demonstrate this power of the sham study to change practice. Um, <clears throat> but, but reading about these trials, you already sense that there's a, a real uh, potential for um, further conflict surrounding them. If you, talk, you read this, the accounts of the, certainly internal memory or legation studies where people are may, maybe not well understanding that they're having uh, non-therapeutic incisions done um, surgically under anesthesia. But in the, also in the gastric freezing studies, people are recruited in these studies and they get information about the trial. It's not always clear in the 1960s what consent in, totally entails. Um, but there's a lot of deception going on within the trial that I think people felt as being unsettling. Um, there's these sort of stage-managed things like uh, Magician's Act where they have little f hidden switches in the device that they throw that'll divert the freezing um, fluids out of the tube before it gets down into the stomach. And so there's this sort of um, apparatus that's got um, concealed mechanisms. And the whole thing has a feel that you might, um, as an outside observer, look at it and have some apprehensions about it. And in, indeed, as you go into the 1970s, there's a, a greater kind of regulatory oversight and ethic, bioethical kind of um, debate emerging about medical research at the times. And this is well told in a number of um, accounts of this, but people often um, describe a kind of back and forth between these f um, dramatic and dismaying kinds of revelations about ethical overstepping within medical research, and then these responses within the regulatory apparatus. So in 1964, there's the exposure of the Jewish chronic disease hospital trials, where physicians were injecting cancer cells into patients within the hospital without any sort of oversight or real consent involved. Um, and then within 1966, the Surgeon General Office's directive that extends that um, NIH clinical center um, methods of oversight and group review of research for ethical conduct to the nation. In uh, 1972, we have the revelation about the Tuskegee syphilis study mm -hmm. subjecting um, men in the South who were poor sharecroppers, African American men, to these um, to the prohibitions, blocking their access to treatment for chronic syphilis to follow its um, natural course. Um, and in 1974, then you have the National Research Act that puts into law some of the Surgeon General's directives and stimulates the 1979 Belmont Report that really spells out some of the, what we think of as the modern elements of um, fully informed and voluntary consent, the balance of risk and benefits within research, some of the criteria that we still use um, in the regulation and bioethical oversight. But, but in this setting, there's a fair amount of debate and, dis and um, anxiety about these trials. The f and um, so one of the trials that's done in 1970s is a sham surgery control trial, 
is actually started in the 1970s, gets pub published, started in the 1970s, gets published in 1981, a placebo-controlled trial of mastoidectomy for many years disease in which they did sham surgery on the mastoid cells behind the ear to try to relieve, um, as a, to compare with a treatment for many years disease. Uh, and the person who does that study says, well, the patients were informed that they were participating in a trial testing the efficacy of two different surgical procedures, but they were not informed that half of them were being submitted to a placebo operation. And then goes on to say, um, since the, this trial was begun before the Helsinki Declaration on Medical Experimentation was issued, and certainly we would never do anything like that now. So there's a great deal of concern about what had been a sort of standard practice. And um, in, the, in the setting of the 70s, this generates a, a, a really within the community of surgery, I think David Jones will tell us about this in much more detail, there's a debate about the um, what does surgical experimentation entail and what are the limits of what will be tolerated within surgical experimentation in the pursuit of good evidence. Um, and the placebo trials become this exemplar in this debate. It seems to stand both for the best and the worst of experimentation within surgery. On one side, the willingness to deceive patients and, and probably, as they realize, not giving them the kinds of options that would be full, make full voluntary consent possible. But on the other side, on the best side, it is a very powerful tool for revising the evidentiary base of surgery. So things that look good in the animal lab, that look good in case series, um, and uh, that are being widely used in practice, can be the rug can be pulled out from under them by this very powerful um, experimental technique. And so for people in this debate, placebo surgery gets to be this hot potato back and forth about what will be, what, the, what, um, what do you look for for an excellence in surgical experience and, and what do you try to avoid? And in that setting, um, I went through and tried to find all the sham trials of, of uh, surgery and inv invasive procedures. And we had a wonderful talk by Jonathan Kimmelman yesterday and he made the distinction about pure surgical sham trials where he was looking only at um, sort of conventional open surgeries and there are very few of those but if you sort of broaden your perspective to say things that are invasive procedures um, you get a fair a, lar a larger number and as you get into the later period this line becomes tougher and tougher to draw um, and I think Jonathan was excluding things like in um, invasive procedures that injected drugs because they're sort of like placebo drug trials. Um, but the kinds of procedures to administer those may be surgical procedures too. So what I've done is take a look very broadly at invasive procedures in surgery. And you can see that um, the 70s, there's a sort of interest that, that wanes and then waxes very strongly um, in the 80s and 90s. And what I'd like to um, observe in the second part of this would be what's what are the different, several different elements contributing to this resurgence and the continuing excitement and interest in the use of these trials at the, at the present? There's a number of them ongoing. Um, part of it is the growing, um, sort of ironically for something that uh, raised co um, concerns on an ethical grounds, it's the um, solidification of the notion of bioethics and regulation of medical research that kind of creates the pathway for this. Um, for example, one of the areas where you see increasing use of <coughs> placebo surgery is within surgically implanted, invasively planted devices. Um, but the devices themselves come under federal regulation. In 1976, the Medical Devices Act <coughs> gave the Food and Drug Administration the power to, um, so a nominal power that they had gets sort of solidified and proceduralized, giving them oversight for the approval for marketing of medical devices that there's a couple different it's a complicated law with a number of different loopholes that are actually fairly significant um, but this is the FDA that now by the 70s is well acquainted with the notion of placebo control as the gold standard for drug trials um, so bringing devices into under scrutiny by the FDA is part of this story and in the 1980s there were a number of sham controlled studies of invasively planted, implanted devices in the stomach and esophagus with the rise of the fiber optic endoscopy. Um, and those are, those are one of the pathways for FDA approval by these devices. Um, so you can see it being drawn into this regulatory apparatus, the notion of placebo sham controls. Um, it, it does also generate, because as you, at the same time you're having a whole host of um, now formally trained bioethicists, often philosophically based, 
um, in the 1970s, certainly by the 1980s, of being established within academic medical centers. Um, and in the, in the 1990s, the next big sham surgery trial hits the press in the New England Journal. Um, there is a study of treatment for Parkinson's disease that um, actually Jonathan Kimmelman told us a little about, about yesterday, <coughs> where um, the procedure is to put um, fetal tissue into the brain to um, pr produce some of the um, neurotransmitters that are being lost in Parkinson's disease. To do that requires drilling burr holes in the skull and inserting the material down into the brain. Um, so sham, but Parkinson's disease is a very, very is a variable um, clinical course, and a lot of the assessment of it is assessment of subjective outcomes. Um, the people who did this trial felt very strongly you wouldn't know if this had an effect unless you compared it to placebo very rigorously. So there's a placebo, a sham surgical trial, um, several of them actually in succession, um, that use sh um, burr holes in the skull as the sham um, control arm. This leads to a debate among bioethicists about the limits of medical experimentation. One of the people who comes out very strongly against this categorically in the bioethics community is um, Ruth Macklin, who's there shown at the podium discussing this uh, trial. And she claimed that uh, you couldn't do um, sham surgical trials of this sort ethically. It imposed all sorts of risks on people of infection when you drill a hole in the skull, um, bleeding. Uh, and uh, the risk of anesthesia itself was very was significant. It had been reducing a lot. But um, why would you tolerate this in an experimental trial when there's no way you would tolerate this for a placebo in practice? So that she finds it to be unethical. Um, she also ha offers the implication that uh, by using more sham surgical um, arms in research, you may be sort of indirectly. Uh, validating the idea that these could happen in regular practice too, which is interesting sort of um, element. She's saying, well, won't people start to say, well, let's do these procedures because they make people feel better even if they're shams. Um, so she's, she's uh, um, I think uh, Jonathan called her a um, uh, sham surgery abolitionist. Um, and, and there's other people within the bioethics community. Alex London comes out very strongly against them. But on the whole, you have this um, articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine that then publishes the debate with other folks like uh, Dr. Franklin on the other side arguing very strongly that they're entirely ethical because they followed all these procedures that are laid out very carefully in our regulations of medical research that include um, explicitly um, detailed informed consent, um, an attempt to reduce risk to the lowest possible level that makes it compatible with the completion of this study. Um, that there's, and there's a form of equipoise, because we don't know whether this thing is going to work or not, this implantation of fetal material. So you've got a very um, bioethically rigorous set of procedures that have been followed, and therefore it's fine to do it. And actually you've got the trials that are published in the same issue of New York Journal already done, so the notion that they were going to sort of pitch these out as whole, uh, the way Ruth Macklin was um, suggesting seems a little unlikely. Uh, but it's interesting then, um, after this sort of explosion of attention in the bioethics community, um, it, it largely fades. Um, it becomes sort of a debate. There are people who disagree and agree, but the procedures are there in place and the ethical practices can be run. And so um, we sort of shift modes because the most famous recent of these studies um, draws almost no ethical comment at all, but it, it creates a, a firestorm of a different sort. Um, and that's the sham arthroscopy trial published in 2002, got started before 1996 in, uh, in Houston. Um, here's just some of the key investigators. They're, they're here receiving the um, DeBakey Award at Baylor for Excellence in Medical Research. There's Michael DeBakey in the center. And, oh, I can't, there we go. This is, here are the two primary investigators, uh, Nell DeRay, who was a health services researcher at the VA hospital, which is conducted. And Bruce Mosley, who was an orthopedic surgeon who did knee arthroscopies and then subjected them to a test against a fake knee arthroscopy to show if it was an adequate treatment for osteoarthritis. And this is Baruch Brody, who is a um, philosophically trained University of Virginia bioethicist who helped to um, create very detailed mechanisms for informed consent that would help to secure um, adequate kinds of voluntary consent for this trial. And also wrote with Nell DeRay a very um, uh, elaborate kind of ra um, rationale bioethically for the conduct of these kind of trials that, uh, uh, that it's wonderfully argued and um, 
and persuasive and became one of the sort of basis for um, quelling some of the dis dis um, discussion about the ethics of this trial. This still, this is an ongoing issue in bioethics, but not so much in the press. So occasionally it, it erupted in the new, I mean, in the Wall Street Journal about 10 years ago. There's been another little flurry of activity. Um, but what happens instead is that a different sort of debate um, comes, uh, is, is generated by this, about the, um, about payment and co medical costs um, and uh, utilization. Uh, it, uh, immediately the letters are um, of the sort from orthopedic surgeons saying, because they've done this trial showing that the knee arthroscopy for um, osteoarthritis is only as good as a sham version, the VA is now writing that out of their covered um, uh, procedures and Medicare soon follows and the use of this particular kind of arthroscopy falls pretty steadily um, following that. But people notice quickly that, um, and uh, the publications sort of make this point, I think the Mosley and Ray publication says, there's billions of dollars spent on this procedure annually, they might go to other better uses. Um, so they're really trying to push this issue of the overall cost of procedures and how the sham surgery can alter that. Um, but they, people are noticing that the rate of knee arthroscopy for osteoarthritis continues to rise. There's a dip in the debridement procedure that's placebo controlled and shown to be a sham, but there's a rise in another kind of procedure, which is um, partial meniscectomy for knee arthro ar ar osteoarthritis. Um, the justifications for that seem just as suspect to certain people within the community as had the original procedure. So um, people continue to go after it. Um, this is Rain Sivonen, who's an orthopedic surgeon in Finland. His, um, he's here in a, a Finnish uh, newsletter. I did Google Translate on that phrase at the bottom. It said, according to Google Translate, Placebo will be surgery research. <laughs> and he takes on this notion of meniscectomy from knee arthroscopy by another sham um, uh, um, study. He does fake knee arthroscopy versus actual partial meniscectomy, and in 2013 publishes in New England Journal again, which seems to have a predilection for these kind of publications, um, showing that there's no difference. And uh, they're now trying to reduce the incidence of this meniscectomy that kind of replaced the debridement procedure that was debunked. So, and and Sivanen's got his, um, this is his target now, because he's going after trying to put the final nail in the coffin. He's now following up on the people who had the sham arms of the partial meniscectomy versus the people in the control arm long term to, with the hypothesis that the partial meniscectomy will worsen osteoarthritis over time. So they have an ongoing study to make a sort of final look at this. Um, and so you can see that, um, and this is a marker for um, what I'll close with, which is uh, the current status of this procedure of, of sham surgery trials. Um, kind of globally, they're happening, the, um, the ones that are tending to debunk things are happening in places with um, closed medical systems. Um, uh, Finland, um, the Netherlands, um, the UK, there's a sham placebo-controlled arthroscopic labral tear of the hip um, place uh, study going on right now. You can find it in clinicaltrials.gov in Oslo, Norway. And there are a couple reasons, and, but um, in the United States, the ones that are happening are for new procedures. And so there continue to be these implanted fetal tissue kinds of studies that have sham arms that require invasive sham procedures. So the ones that are about procedures that are already in place tend to be in systems with these closed um, in, you know, universal coverage um, systems. And the ones that are for new procedures tend to be in the U.S. There's, there's exceptions, but that's kind of a, an interesting generalization, I think. And there's several reasons. One is difficulty of recruiting patients in an open system. Why would you enter a trial of knee arthroscopy if you, don't, if you think it works um, when you could go across the street and get it somewhere else? Some of the, the knee arthroscopy trial was in the VA system, which is, again, a closed system for coverage. Um, and uh, um, so the new ones uh, use the appeal that you can get this um, experimental new procedure done as a patient only if you come into this research trial because that's the only place it's being offered. So you can recruit patients that way. Harder to recruit people, um, but if you're in a closed system in Finland, maybe easier to recruit patients that need to go through the system where you're doing the experimental trials to get knee arthroscopy done at all. Um, and on the other side, too, of course, the surgeons have different kinds of incentives in these different systems where they have a proprietary interest in the health of the overall financial state of a system where it's closed in, say, Norway, whereas um, they want to continue to do tr um, procedures that would be reimbursed on a cost basis in the U.S. where it's harder to get um, 
people, orthopedic surgeons, for example, to want to do studies. They'll undermine the very procedure that they've practiced very hard to learn how to do. Um, so I think that gives you a sort of overall sense of where it may be going. And uh, certainly it, it um, looks like it's an active and well-accepted part of the experimental repertoire of surgery at this point. Um, so I'll close with that. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. You uh, really opened up the discussion for, uh, and it reminds me of the days when I was a senior resident. And uh, I had a partner who was a senior resident in medicine. His name was Phil Gold. We decided that we were, we were sold by the, uh, by the uh, machine, so we, uh, we wanted to do a, a, a control study. And we, uh, we spoke to the Swanko people. Huh. They gave us a machine. And Phil said, in order to prove this, we have to do a sham. We have to have, we'll have to figure out how we can get this. And then you know you had to put a big tube down into the stomach, circulate cold, we measured temperature, we measured acid, and so on. Yeah. And we proved that it had, had, had no effect. But wow. uh, the, at that time, we had no ethics. Our staff men didn't even know what we were doing. Yeah. It was, uh, I mean, we just were allowed to go ahead and, and do it. So, yeah. uh, uh, lots of questions, lots of hands up. Yeah. Oh, no, Thomas, how long should we spend on questions? I didn't know what yeah, what's that. So, uh, on the uh, schedule, it says 10.30, but we can go over it. Okay, so we'll take we have, we have some minutes. break with the coffee uh, Yeah, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> I was just wondering about the role of the patient community, particularly in the last sort of 15 years. Because I was thinking the skull surgery example is really interesting. And I was thinking Parkinson's disease has quite a strong patient community around it. Yeah. Is there support coming from those kind of patient communities for this kind of research? I think uh, certainly there's, um, that's a big element of research support in the, you know, in the late 20th century into the 21st century. I would, um, and I haven't looked at those, you know, at, at, and there's great um, web pages and publications from these, um, you know, Parkinson's groups for support. Um, and I think the general theme is re more research is better. Um, and I suspect that they're simply finding that the sham studies are being offered as the only version of how you're going to get this fetal tissue implantation procedure done. Um, and, but I don't know how they, uh, what, I have not looked at that. It'd be really interesting to know if there's, public, if there's discussion within those communities about the, about the sham arms. Um, yeah, it's good. I don't know. Uh, I always think of the power of the word, of the individual word. And if you said to me, uh, or if I was organizing a placebo trial, it sounds okay, this sounds rigorous, sounds scientific. But when you say to me, oh, I'm organizing a sham trial, <laughs> it sounds so pejorative that already I know that, my God, how can you even pursue this? But that's, uh, that's just a, an aside. And I think what was so beautiful about yesterday's talk was how simplistic the surgeons were in the mid-1800s and early 1800s, because their outcome was death. Here, we do surgery. I do surgery where I know it has a not one iota of difference in the long-term survival of my patient. But because they have discomfort, marks, or pain, or a little bit of lifestyle irritation, they want to have this operation because they think it's God's gift to humanity. And I think a lot of surgeons are very myopic when they look at surgery because they see something and they say, okay, I'll take it away. Mm -hmm. And that's how I operate. Mm -hmm. If I see a fibroid and the patient is mm -hmm. coming to my office every month, I'm going to take out the fibroid. I mean, reality. Okay. Not that she's going to live longer, not that she's going to have a better life necessarily. But that's what we've done. We've evolved our patient population into this expectation. It's a, a nice point about sham versus placebo. Um, I corresponded with the people in Finland about their study. Um, and one of my questions was, uh, their original publication announcing the trial calls it a trial of placebo surgery. When it shows up in the New England Journal, the title is Sham Surgery Controls. So I asked them, I said, why the change? Uh, and the response was, it was the editors at New England Journal, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. It may be that that's, you know, that maybe it draws eyeballs to the page. Or, yeah. Or, or, yeah. What's it? Sells the paper. 
Yeah, sells the paper, yes. Uh -huh. But also, too, I think New England Journal also had this sense that they were publishing these trials. They've been sort of the go-to place for the big prominent ones. And they published the whole Ruth-Macklin debate. They're trying to sort of show that they're sensitive to the um, ethical c concerns that people continue to express about these trials while publishing them and promoting them as being the best evidence possible. So, so it's also kind of expiation, I think, too. Harvey? Dr. Martin uh, spoke about patients' expectations, and so I think really placebo studies deal with patients' expectations. How one measures that is a different mm -hmm. issue. And I became aware of this very acutely when we started to do minimally invasive uh, gallbladder surgery, mm -hmm. because we used to tell patients, you're going to have this operation, and you're going to go home 24 hours, and that was wonderful. In those days, patients, at least in Canada, probably not in the U.S., used to stay in the hospital for one week after a gallbladder operation. It's that many of them had drains, sometimes they were there for 10 days, and that was the norm. So I would tell these patients, you're going to go home the next day, but every once in a while you had to convert to an open operation. And so the first time I converted to an open operation, I said to the patient, look, I'm sorry, I had to open because it was difficult and I had to do it safely. And the patient said, do you think I can have an extra day in the hospital? And I said, sure, you're going to have an extra day. The patient went home in two days. And I said, my God, you know, the patients <laughs> thought they're going to go home in a day, and now they're willing to take one extra day. That's a real bargain. You're doubling their time. So perhaps we can use some of this issue of expectation to improve output outcomes. Because if patients think they're going to get better, and if placebos really have an effect, then patients probably would get better faster. So maybe this is something we should be thinking about. Yeah. I think that is the, uh, that's what you're saying about the placebo effect of coronary ligation, just having an incision on your chest. Did, uh, yeah, people felt better. And, and the thing that Ruth Macken was sort of highlighting was, isn't this making us a little too comfortable with the notion of the placebo effects of surgery? She sort of suggests that. And there's some evidence, I love this survey, the, um, one of the other big ongoing, I'm going to show you something in a second here that relates to this, if I can pull it up. So. Yeah. So um, one, there's a big ongoing uh, placebo surgery trial also in the UK for shoulder impingement. And the randomization is to um, arthroscopy of the shoulder to um, debride to relieve the impingement or just observational arthroscopy. It's a sham controlled style study. And um, in the setting of performing that, um, of recruiting patients in that trial in the UK, they did a survey of orthopedic surgeons in the UK who did shoulder arthroscopy. And they sort of, and they sort of they asked him, it's not a great survey, but it's a fascinating sort of set of information. They asked him questions about, did they believe in placebo? They asked him about uh, whether they believed in placebo effect. And if they did believe it, these people didn't believe in the placebo effect, a minority of 100 orthopedic surgeons. If they did believe in it, did they think it had a therapeutic benefit? If they did, 75 people out of 100 orthopedic shoulder surgeons in the UK said they believed in placebo effect and it had a therapeutic benefit. So they thought you could use things that had a significant placebo effect. Um, mean that you use a sham procedure. What they seemed to mean, because it's done in a rigorous, but they said, would you use procedures in which the was a significant, and you know, they said, if I have something like that, no, a conventional, like, that's an okay thing to do. And so it's only in clinical trials. And, if it was supported by research and experience, it could be something you would actually um, consider as part of the normal surgical effect, which is not really that controversial. But in, if you phrase it in different ways, it, it, lo it, all, it can be... The United States is this concept of preemptive strike. It's yeah. used everywhere. Defense. But this is a topic that Dr. perhaps Dr. Mulder will help me on. And <coughs> that's specifically with coronary artery and when you do bypass surgery. So bypass surgery, person has a heart attack, has... A, tests and they show it's indicated. And yet nowadays, he has angina, it's indicated. Mm -hmm. Nowadays you do a test for no reason, but you did a total body scan. Yeah. And you said, oh my God, there's one vessel that looks like it's getting blocked and I'm yeah. going to do surgery. I mean, I'm paraphrasing what Dr. Gilbert <coughs> Wells talks about in his book, uh, Less uh, Medicine, More Health. Mm -hmm. And this is an issue that now the population at large thinks that we have all this technology that can help us yeah. But we're doing sham surgery. Yeah. For yeah. no reason. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, well, we're a little over the time. I don't know.